Hey guys, uh, week 45 here. I have seven titles to review for you. Uh, uh, some questions, and of course a pick a movie, and an update. I'm going to do the update a little different. I'm going to do hand style, like explosive action, extra on the mutilator, showing the case, and you just hear me talking about them. I think that looks better. Uh, it'll, uh, that way I can get into more details and whatnot, and tell you what's on the damn releases, instead of just running through holding up a bunch of stuff. It's really kind of pointless for you guys. But let me hop right into this. Uh, the first one I will be reviewing is from Synapse Films. This is Path of Blood. Yeah, this looked fairly interesting. I hadn't heard much about it. It's by an animator named Eric Power, the director. Uh, yeah, this is pretty cool stuff, actually. Uh, this was made, uh, I believe, in 2013. This is the first release I know about. It hit a lot of festivals and whatnot. This is a a paper animated uh, samurai movie. It's filled with all like uh, you know the kind of cliches and tropes of uh, the old samurai films with the guy choosing the path. Uh, it's very short. It's 62 minutes. Uh and uh, if you like paper style animation, this is a uh, very well done, much better than uh, something like Dante's Inferno. That doesn't that's fun, but it doesn't look nearly as good or as polished as this one. The animation here is actually very clever as well. How he did it with the with the green uh, paper background, like a green screen, and added in the uh, other animation paper things he made. It follows the story of a uh, wanderer, of course, who uh, is going through this mysterious forest along with a couple uh, friends. Uh, who uh, one has a mission one kind of just going along with it um and uh they run into this this uh forest is uh riddled with uh gangs and uh all sorts of uh bad guys and supposedly these weird shadow ninjas that uh disappeared for years ago and they have this great elaborate backstory which is pretty damn cool uh of course there's other people wandering through the forest and uh they're getting uh picked off by the ninjas of course the ninjas are there and this wanderer is pretty much a badass his whole crew is a badass and they go through all these uh different like levels of uh bad guys uh there's a great scene on a bridge uh, it's just a really well animated movie, and uh, besides with uh, you know that when there's bloodshed and uh, beautiful forest, they also do these uh, cut-ins of the animals kind of watching, like a prey mantis or a turtle. Uh, I really like that stuff. I think that uh, adds interesting. It's like. Uh, Here's this uh, brutality, and then we're going to see this uh, beautiful forest, and then we're going to see this uh, kind of these animals all partaking in the forest as well. Uh, it's, it's well done in that aspect. Uh, it's an entertaining movie. Like I said, it never wears out its welcome. It's very fast paced. The music's well done. The, uh, the voice acting's well done. Actually, in Japanese, which is really cool that they did that. Um, the sound design, solid as well. I would give this a hearty recommendation. It's very fun. Uh, the features on here include the. Uh, the original short, which is about four minutes long, and you can tell how much he progressed in doing this, uh, and uh, a making of, which is about nine minutes, which is uh, straight to the point and gets everything in there. There's also a trailer for a video game proposal, which looks awesome. I wish this was a game. Uh, and also uh, a trailer for the movie and some stills. Uh, so it's not the most packed release, but it's enough stuff to keep you interested and uh, give you a glimpse into this guy's life and what he does. I really, really liked the movie. I thought it was really interesting and uh, animated and uh, animated very well and I, I was very impressed with it. I would really want to check out the guy's other work.
Uh, the next one also from Synapse Films. This is Unearthed and Untold, The Path to Pet Cemetery. Uh, yeah, uh, everybody loves Pet Cemetery, and uh, this is a classic movie. And it's one of those deals where we have these huge documentaries about Nightmare on Elm Street, Halloween, Friday the 13th. Uh, well, the, people go in depth about these movies. And it's funny that stuff like uh, Creep Show, the American release, had absolutely bare bones release, and Pet Cemetery, fairly bare bones, Blu ray and DVD, whatnot. Um, so it's great that we see uh, these, be, these ambitious uh, indie filmmakers that want to go out and make a documentary about their favorite movie. They want to go in deep uh, with, you know, and, and go live leave no rock unturned and that's what uh untold and unearthed the uh, unearthed and untold the uh, path the pet cemetery is it's uh this uh love letter slash making of documentary about pet cemetery which interviews all the big players uh besides stephen king and fred gwynn who passed away but stephen king you know he's busy he doesn't partake in any of these these uh things so it's kind of a lot like just desserts in a way the uh, creep show documentary but uh it also interviews the bit players which i really love and uh it interviews people uh the it interviews the lady who made the pet cemetery that inspired stephen king to write the story if you're not going in you cannot go in any more depth than that uh and, and i love that those are the interviews that are even more appealing than the big stars and the director like mary lambert which are also very nice to see but uh we have these uh these small players who worked on set design production design extras people that knew stephen king while he's writing the book all sorts of stuff like that so it, it paints this picture of the movie and puts you in the place it paints this picture of the time and the place and the film uh, I really enjoyed checking it out. I watching it and learning a lot about Pet Cemetery. Maybe you want to watch Pet Cemetery again. Uh, you know, it's one of King's uh, best adaptations, I think, especially in the '80s, late '80s, '89. Um, and they go into a little bit of the history. They don't really talk about Pet Cemetery too, which I wish they did actually. Uh, which is also directed by Mary Lambert. I actually like the second one myself. Not as good as the first, of course. But they go in uh, the depth and the reception, and they do this all without actual footage from Pet Cemetery because they couldn't use it. They said the licensing fee. On uh, Paramount's part, would have been astronomically expensive compared to their entire budget for the movie. But um, they use uh, uh, artist renditions, illustrations, and stuff like that, and that that's pretty cool. And of course, stills and uh, behind the scenes footage in the 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 release. So it, it's not overly long. It uh, clocks in at about an hour and a half. It's a nice meaty documentary. Uh, the interviews are, are, are fun. People seem candid. They seem uh, happy to talk about it. None of them seem bitter. None of them seem angry. None of them seem like they're just going through the motions. That's very nice to see. Uh, and they do include Stephen King some in some ways, like uh, him on stage and stuff, talking about the movie, uh, but no direct interviews with them. They also include Fred Gwynn and kind of incorporate him in the movie by asking everybody how he was and whatnot. And, you know, he was pretty much one of the huge staples of Pet Cemetery. But, uh, yeah, I would really recommend checking this out i enjoyed it uh the commentary on here is a little weak but it's a commentary about a documentary it's a little iffy the podcast uh on here is included is pretty cool uh there's also scenes extra scenes uh longer interviews things like that uh and some other uh slew of features on here i, I would recommend checking it out especially if you're a fan of pet cemetery I, it, it's worth it's worth seeing for sure I wrote a book called Pet Cemetery. When I finished the book, I actually put it in a drawer because I didn't think anybody would want to read anything like that, but they did. I first read the Pet Cemetery script when I was an executive at Embassy Pictures. I left Embassy in 1985 to become an executive at Paramount, and I tried to get Pet Cemetery made, but the prevailing opinion in those years was that the time for Stephen King movies had come and gone. Ready? And go. He doesn't just write a scary monster in the closet story. It's always a psychological aspect to it. It was one of those films that you find with a group of friends and you all immediately love it. It was a woman directing a horror film. It made my career as a film director. It's still my most successful film. I went in on the callback with her, and because of child labor laws at the time, I think that probably helped. Miko Hughes was a really important part of this film. Paramount was not happy. They wanted twins. Shoot it, shoot it, schedule it. I didn't find actually the working with uh, the child very difficult at all. The cats were another story altogether. I've always loved Fred Gwynn. He was an amazing actor. What? He liked to play this? 
Who's Fred Gwynn? He is the one that sets the whole story in motion. When I learned that he had written a book based on My Pet Cemetery, it was really quite mind-boggling. He can see something like that and get the beginnings of a story. I knew this fictional character, and this was real flesh and blood. All the people who died in this film you cared about. Pet Cemetery is really a timeless story. The Zelda scene is my favorite. I mean, that scared the shit out of me. Rachel. <laughs> Don't screw up a shot, though, because, you know, these people are going to be really angry with you if you do. They said, don't worry, we're not going to burn the other house down. They assured me that nothing would go wrong. Dale actually got a second degree burn. It felt like the fire was right in my face. He lunges me, he bites it, pulls it off. Fred's going, oh! And me feel freaked out. I really wanted to pull it off. It was very claustrophobic. I think I enjoy watching Pet Cemetery the most. It's the easiest to disconnect myself from it. It took another year or so before I was able to watch it from the beginning to the end. You have got to go to Midtown to see Pet Cemetery. She said there was a whole crowd of kids that went, jump, bitch! It's such a specific moment in time that I hardly remember, and yet it seems to have affected a generation of people that it's just amazing to me that it can be so powerful. At least something could come of it. This place. Couldn't plant none of the corpses here anyway, I guess. The next one here. My God, did Arrow outdo themselves again with Basket Case by Frank Hannenlotter. Yeah. If you guys haven't seen Basket Case, you gotta see it. It's a 1982 uh, sleaze masterpiece. Uh, Frank Hannenlotter did a, a bunch of movies, including Frankenhooker, Brain Damage, Basket Case 2, Basket Case 3, uh, Bad Biology. Um, he's a, a very, very interesting director, and one of the only directors that I would say uh, that's still alive that has a unique voice, that right when you see it, you know that's a Frank Hannenlotter movie. You know it. Um, and uh, basically, in the interviews and everything... Hannenlotter said this was his, uh, uh, you know, this is what he made after growing up on 42nd Street, and it shows. Basket Case follows the story of uh, Siamese twins who were separated by doctors against their will, but uh, there's, a, there's a catch to it. Uh, Dwayne uh, Bradley is the fairly normal-looking brother, and Belial is his twisted, gross little brother that he keeps in a basket. These two are on a mission to... Um, Go kill the doctors who separated them when they were young. Uh, and that's pretty much the plot of Basket Case. Uh, the backdrop or the setting is sleazy, gritty 80s New York City. Uh, filled with zany, weird characters that feel like they pop out of a Paul, Paul Bartel movie. Uh, the only movie I can, you know, um, Hennelotter feels like he would be comparable to only Paul Bartel as the only other director I can compare him to, really, uh, where he has a lot of zany, weird characters. But uh, Hennelotter pushes the boundaries when it comes to gore. He, he likes the... the the nasty gore and blood and splutter, uh, sp splatter in, in a comedic way. But also, Hennenlotter uses these old techniques like stop motion and things like that in his movies, which kind of shows his love for film in general. And I really enjoy seeing that. Uh, Basket Case, to me, is one of my favorite horror movies. I've always enjoyed it. I've always, uh, we forget to bring it up when we when people talk about small creature movies, but it's it's got to be one of the best, hands down, top three. But uh, I just love the storyline. I love Belial. He looks a very unique. He's a very unique monster. And um, unlike any other. And uh, there, there's parts where you laugh out loud. Uh, this, it's super sleazy and super gritty. It's never looked better. I can't believe this looks this good. This is from the 16 millimeter print uh, that they took. And and this was blown up to 35 millimeter at, at one point, I think. And uh, uh the, the other Blu-ray from Something Weird looked good, but not nearly as good as this. This movie is in full screen. I think it was shot in full screen, so that's what you get, similar to Night of Living Dead. Uh, but yeah, it, it looks phenomenal. It sounds phenomenal. Uh, I always uh, really enjoyed the performances in here by Dwayne. Uh, the, the more, I mean, I the more I see it, the more I enjoy the performance. I love Belial's character. Uh, and uh, at one point you feel sorry for Belial, but towards the end of the movie, it just pushes that point where you're like, oh my God, when it goes to there, you just... Like, I love all the side characters in here are hilarious, and they work really well. 
Uh, just a very unique world that only Frank Hanenlotter could create. As for the features, I have to look at the back because this is the most stacked release I think Arrow's ever done. One of them for sure. There's two commentaries, one new, one old. Uh, there's interviews with a bunch of people. Uh, they made this uh, special short for the movie, uh, Basket Case 3.5, which includes Dwayne, uh, which... Uh, the actor who played uh, Dwayne. It's really funny. It's really great. It includes the short film Slash of the Knife that was made before. Uh, this one is hilarious. It's a 30 minute movie about the kind of like teen scare movies or like the marijuana scare movies, but it's about circumcision. It is one of the funniest things. Laugh a second movie. I loved it. It has great gags, uh, <clears throat> visual gags, and just lots and lots of fun stuff. Uh, Hannah Lauder's in it, a bunch of familiar faces. It's black and white. It's great. It's hilarious. It's worth watching just for this whole it's worth buying just for this if you haven't seen that uh, it includes a bunch of uh, footage from like uh, at uh, the screening of a basket case uh, and it also includes the hour uh, and some change uh, documentary that was included on the second site uh, triple feature blu-ray which I think is great because I don't have that set and uh, seeing that feature really uh, you know saved me from some from uh, some money from buying that set to see that feature. So yeah, it, it ports over everything from the old release, even some of the stuff from the UK release. It's uh, the quintessential basket case. Everybody needs it. If you like Frank Hanelotter, if you like basket case, if you like sleaze, if you like New York City sleaze uh, with that grimy, nasty feeling like the New York Ripper or, or street trash or uh, stuff like that, uh, or Maniac, you got to you gotta get basket case. It's a one-of-a-kind movie. It's a, This this release is, is top-notch. Uh Love the release, love the movie. Uh, good job, Arrow. Great job, actually. What's in the basket? Easter eggs? The, the, the skin is very brutal, and between the two of them, we made that work. And, uh, you know, when you can't afford effects, you throw around gore, you throw around blood. Uh, okay, I, I used to think, after a while, it was simply, if somebody lets us film in their house and doesn't hate us afterwards, we got off okay. Yeah. The only pictures the media had of me was after I fell out of the window, I had bandages on my face. And so when they came back, we had a couple of platters and we put out a couple of half sandwiches. And said, oh my God, we forgot to tell you that we had lunch for you. We had, we didn't have lunch for her. And they'd run about an hour and they would have a magnetic soundtrack. And they were all shot in, in not Super 8, but regular 8. Now, uh, probably the strangest location we filmed at was right here beneath 9th Avenue at 14th Street, which is now the notorious Hellfire S&M Club. This one has to wonder, why have conjoined twins captured the imaginations of both filmmakers and audiences in a way that other so-called freaks have never seemed to duplicate? You heard me, Weisenheimer! Show it back on! <laughs> The next one is from Arrow Academy. This is The Witches. And this is an interesting movie. I, I had not seen this. Uh, this is directed by like four, actually five Italian directors. Uh, you know, some of the bigger names that directed this is an anthology is uh, Pasolini and Visconti. So yeah, it has some big names on it. All stars the same lead actress who is married to the producer, Dino Del Relantes. I mispronounced his name, but this guy produced everything. Uh, lots of weird, crazy, over-the-top stuff, including Maximum Overdrive and, you know, some classier art films, Dune. So 
so he produced a lots and lots of weird stuff. And the lead actress in this movie is actually married to him. So that explains why she's in every role. Not saying that she didn't do a particularly great job because she does an amazing job. It's kind of a vehicle for her to showcase her talents in five different roles. All right, this anthology, like I said, they're all different directors. They're all very different. None of them are alike at all. The first one follows this kind of high-class Hollywood party where all these uh, gossip and uh, stuff is going on. This one is interesting. I think it's, uh, it's kind of cool. To show, you know, a glimpse into the Hollywood, uh, or not, maybe it's not even Hollywood, but being a celebrity in Italy and whatnot. The next one is, is kind of a throwaway. It's a joke about a woman who picks up a guy who's injured and says, I'll take him to the hospital just because she's in a rush and wants to get somewhere. That's the punchline. It's very short. Uh, the One of the longer ones in here is by Pasolini, which is strange because the only Pasolini movie I've seen is Salo. So uh, when that name comes up, you're like, oh no, what's this going to be? And this one is a slapstick love letter to like the kind of silent air uh, comedy actors. And th this is interesting stuff. It's, it's kind of, it, it's really funny. Uh, and the lead actress in this does the whole role completely silent. At a point, she points to a, a picture of uh, Charlie Chaplin and you get it there. So it, it's paying this homage. And, and the two, uh, it's about a father and son who lose their wife and they need to find a new mother and wife. So they, they look around and they end up picking this uh, this mute woman and of course they make her do this really idiotic thing to try to make more money for themselves, a get-rich-fast scheme. And uh, it ends in tragedy. It's a very bizarre short. It's long, it's goofy, it's visually, it's funny. Everybody looks re silly. Uh, the set design's great in it. it. It's a really interesting short. I, I really like that one. Uh, once you think about it a little bit longer. And then there are two more in here. One is very odd about a, a woman who's a uh, superstition in here. It's the most witchcraft one. Uh, uh, Tim Lucas is, does the commentary on here, and he mentions that this is the only one that involves any sort of witchcraft. It involves a voodoo doll and uh, a woman saying, this person put a curse on me or did something to me, and uh, her father yells at her, and she says, I'll never tell. And then she tells anyways, and it ends all this tragedy. It's kind of funny, kind of uh, very short, very weird. Uh, and the last one is uh, one of the most bizarre, one of the most unique. It actually has Clint Eastwood. And when I was watching the credits and it said with Clint Eastwood, I was like, that's got to be a joke because they may, they have to do the Western thing. But no, this is a completely different role for Clint Eastwood too. A very interesting role. He plays this kind of uh, tired, you know, lethargic husband to uh, our lead. And she is bored with her life and she keeps kind of, uh, you know, thinking about other things. That, uh, what am I thinking? Um daydreaming into like uh possible scenarios where she's really mean to him or you know he's romantic and all these things and and Clint Eastwood sit there trying not to fall asleep and uh she's just getting having these visions of violence or these uh old visions of like romance romance it, it's it's very weird and a very bizarre role for Clint Eastwood and uh, it, it's very unique it gets very big at the end I think it's pretty cool interesting stuff uh lots of uh you know weird uh sets in this one for sure and uh interesting uh set designs what they did with it and how it, it switches back and forth and again a good performance from the lead uh clint eastwood's also interesting uh and it is an italian so it's very strange uh to see clint not speak english but you can watch the english version where clint speaks uh in his regular ver I, I did watch his parts in english to uh to notice it and there are some uh changes here and there there's a shorter english version on here uh, as well. And there's an interview with, uh, I'm in a commentary with, uh, Tim Lucas. Uh, is it Tim Lucas? Yeah. Tim Lucas. And he's always super, um, informative and, uh, fills you in on some of the gaps and who the bit players are and what they went on to do and, uh, where they're born, where they died and everything in between. But, uh, a nice release for a fairly interesting anthology that I had not heard anything about beforehand. <laughs>
The next one here is uh, Psycho Killer. Yeah, that cover art really catches your attention, doesn't it? It's very bright, very vibrant. Uh, this is a weird movie. This is a... Uh, uh, I guess it's a coming of age story about a female serial killer. It's got uh, familiar faces like Ron Jeremy and it's uh, Malcolm McDowell, Daniel Baldwin, and Michael Madsen, of course. So, you know, it's got these kind of uh, actors that will pop up in a lot of things. Sometimes good, sometimes bad, sometimes in the middle. Psycho Killer. This one, uh, it took about 30 minutes for me to realize if this was a joke or not. And uh, I was like, is this really bad on purpose or is this really bad on accident? And you realize it is silly on purpose, but uh, it's all done in narration. And uh, I don't want to sound uh, harsh, but this would have needed a really commanding performance. And I don't think that the lead, along with the dialogue, does it well. It could be the dialogue, could be the, the narration. Um, it doesn't really work for me. I don't think that uh, it, it, it's... Uh, a strong enough performance to carry the whole film. And that's pretty much as this whole movie is put the shoulders on the lead here. I'm not saying it's her fault. It's just that it's just too much on her to make a good movie. Uh, we have this uh, girl who realizes uh, early in a college class that, uh, you know, her sexuality is directly linked with uh, violence. And she goes on a kill crazy rampage to kill kind of scummy men, including Ron Jeremy and Malcolm McDowell. And for no reason, Daniel Baldwin in a tiny cameo that doesn't make any sense, but who cares? Uh, uh, Ron Jeremy's kind of funny in it. Um, like I said, the lead is a little iffy. Almost all of it is in narration, and uh, maybe that possibly is due to some bad a uh, bad audio because I had trouble hearing some of the dialogue over the music. Uh, a lot of it might have been ADR'd, and the narration just sounds really painful to me. It just seems forced. I, I didn't particularly like the movie, uh, but I think it is kind of like something like maybe American Psycho 2 where it's so tongue-in-the-cheek and campy. Uh, it's very campy that... Uh, Maybe hokey is the word for it because I don't think it's, you know, and, and maybe purposely campy um, and hokey and whatnot that uh, it just made it really too awkward for me. Some people might really like this kind of thing, you know. I know that a lot of people like that stuff. This this one isn't for me. There's no real features on the disc, but uh, check out the trailer if it interests you. Uh, there is some blood splatter here and there, but it's not overly uh, gory or anything like that. And there is some beautiful lighting and colors, but that's about as far as, uh, you know, I can say what I liked about it. The only thing I'm interested in is your ability to recognize the unique positions that we humans find ourselves in. And this whole notion that we're supposed to be civilized. Do you have any books on contemporary serial killers? I can teach you. You can learn from me. You killed 17 people. Turn around and walk away. Holy shit! What are you doing? That's not funny. I'm gonna get an A in your class. The next one I watched on Amazon streaming. I had a VHS of this movie, believe it or not. It is Five from Hell from 1969. I had never seen it. It's a Man on a Mission movie. Definitely inspired by stuff like The Dirty Dozen and The Glorious Bastards. But yeah, uh, Five for Hell. The most familiar face in this is Klaus Kinski, and he plays an evil Nazi, which is a great casting for Klaus Kinski because uh, what you hear about him is he probably was a damn Nazi. He was so crazy and weird. But uh, yeah, follows the story of five soldiers who all have special talents that are sent on this mission to basically uh, get this uh, plan B or this this plan this, uh, to stop this um, plan from carrying out because if they, they find out this plan and, and they stop it it will save thousands of American and allied forces lives um, the first uh, two thirds of this movie are are really boring. They're not great. It opens up in the uh, with a kind of trickaroo where it does this thing where you think they're in live combat similar to Zero Boys and the scene in Dirty Dozen where you know it's not live combat where they do the uh, uh, fake mission so that they can see if they pass they can go on to the real mission but they do this and uh, it's funny because when people are getting shot or when people are getting hurt it looks just as real as the rest of the movie. So it, <laughs> you're just like okay whatever. Uh, I do like some of the characters in the movie though I'll be honest and the last act I love. I adore the last act which makes this movie fairly decent to me uh it pushes it over the average boundary 
Uh, some of the some of the characters are unique. Like I said, one's a bomb expert, and uh, the guy pops up in uh, the Death Walks at High Heels and Death Walks at Midnight uh, movies. I believe uh, I can't think of his name uh, uh, off the top of my head, but I think he plays one of the villains in that in one of those movies. He's uh, the bomb expert, uh, kind of dorky guy. They always call it Chicken. We got the high highly agile guy that's doing front flips off trampolines. The lead guy who has a baseball with a weight in it that throws it at people. The strong guy and uh, the safe cracker. So you, you got a nice little crew with all these talents i really like the strong guy too and uh the movie progresses and of course there's spy intrigue and is this person who's their uh their um what is it they're inside to find the plan gonna be found out and it's a female and klaus kinski has a thing for her and he wants her to go to bed to him with him and whatnot and uh claus is really great and it really creepy and the score in here is actually fantastic i really love the score uh and the last act is action-packed and you actually start to feel for these characters by that moment and uh, i think they did that fairly well at the end uh claus is great the music's great and uh the last act is action-packed a lot of shooting i just wish the 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 first and the second parts were a little bit more uh, coherent in a, in storyline, and uh, you know you could tell who the people were a little bit better. It looks like crap on Amazon streaming. Um, it's one of these deals where I watch a lot of the VHS rips they have on Amazon streaming uh, on a smaller screen because they look so bad on the big screen. I watch them when I'm running and with uh, like wireless headphones because when I watch them on my TV they look like shit. I'm like so I watch them uh, on kind of a smaller screen like that, and uh, they look okay on there, but they're not anything special. But Five from Hell is an interesting uh, man on a mission movie. It's not perfect, but uh, the last act makes up for a lot. Mettere assieme cinque uomini, un necessario allenare un'intera brigata. Una compagnia di guastatori selezionò i primi due. Al Siracusa, Nick Amadori. Il terzo, un impallibile lanciatore di coltello, Sam McCarthy. Johnny White, il quarto, adorava un'esplosiva ragazza a nome Dinamite e un autentico campione di baseball, il quinto, Clem Hoffman, detto pitcher. Cinque per l'inferno, un inferno che si identificava nel nome di Hans Müller, colonnello delle SS. Helga Ritter, un'ausiliaria tedesca, aveva accettato per denaro un gioco molto pericoloso. Adesso, Hans Müller, fa di me quello che vuoi. Certo, Fräulein. Cinque per l'inferno. Ma che culo! Ora oh, no, 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 mistica. Sti tedeschi, so figlia mamma pure loro, sai. Villa Verde. In una cassaforte era custodito il famoso piano K. Ma come arrivarci?
Okay, the pick uh, of the week was by Adam Weber, and he picked Road to Perdition by Sam Mendes. Believe it or not, I never saw it. There's a lot of movies like that that I never watched. Uh, and, you know, I'm glad he gave me a good pick. I'm glad he gave me a good movie. Road to Perdition has Tom Hanks, Jude Law, uh, Daniel Craig, and uh, Paul Newman, Jennifer Jason Lee, it, uh, Dylan Baker, uh, Stanley Tucci. It's got a great cast. And it, it's based off a graphic novel, which threw me for a loop when I was watching the credits. I was like, okay, this this... I don't know. This looks like it's pretty serious. How's that graphic novel going to play out? Is it going to be comic booky? But uh, it wasn't, and I was really impressed with the movie. Road to Perdition uh, is in the 30s during the Depression, and uh, Tom Hanks plays this gangster who has a family. It seems like the only thing he cares about is, you know, his boss, Paul Newman, who's like a father to him, and his own family, of course. Uh, two boys and, a, and his wife. Tom Hanks... Um, one of his kids sneaks along for a ride and uh, secretly and sees Tom Hanks and Daniel Craig, who's Paul Newman's son, who's a psychopath, crazy person, uh, kill some people. This creates this turmoil between Daniel Craig and Tom Hanks, and Daniel Craig decides to do something under his father's nose, which creates this uh, horrible uh, set of circumstances and tragedy uh, tra uh, tragedy that uh, sets Tom Hanks in motion where he just can't rest, and he needs to get some old-school revenge. Um, Tom Hanks in this movie is tremendous. He plays uh, very very cold in some ways, but very warm, and uh, feels real like warm towards his family, but also cold and uh, distant at times, but very cold and... Uh, bad he's, he's a bad guy but you like him they, they do these things where they make him real uh paul newman's always great uh, i haven't seen that many paul newman movies to be honest so he's always great when i see him uh and this one he actually is is is, is really good in it uh daniel craig is a sleazy piece of crap but uh jude law is a highlight in this one jude law plays this a photographer they hire to uh, he's a photographer assassin who's who likes to take the pictures of the bodies after he kills them. And uh, they uglied up Jude Law uh, so so much here. Yellow teeth, balding head, and his whole posture, the way he walks and everything. He does, he does a really good job. He is gross, boy. He is gross. Uh, but, yeah, um, there's some really good action scenes in here when they happen, but uh, there's some really great suspense moments. Uh, my favorite moment in the movie is when you know something's up and uh i don't want to spoil too much but uh tom hanks is supposed to deliver this note he doesn't know what's on the note he thinks it's just a typical you know uh you're back on money and he delivers to this guy and this note says something different and i don't want to spoil what happens but the acting by all three of the people involved in that scene is tremendous it's a very intense moment uh and it's just an all-around great scene probably the best scene in the movie uh, there's great moments between Tom Hanks and his son, and it opens with narration, which I really actually like. Sometimes I like narration. I like Psycho Killer. I do like the narration in this one quite a bit. Um, and, and you do know what's going to happen. It's never a surprise. The ending's never a surprise. Uh, there's just some beautiful moments they set up here, though, when uh, Tom Hanks is watching the ocean and uh, the water waves are coming up and his breathing seems to match up with it like he's relaxing and he's calm. Uh, and they do smart things, like um, at, at points... Uh, there's a scene where a whole bunch of people die, but they're not really uh, main characters or anything like that. And you you don't see, you don't hear the gunshots. You hear silence. You see them getting shot in the rain in slow motion. And then it switches to an important character dying, and you don't see it, but you hear the gunshots. And that is jarring, and it, it's just the right thing to do in the dramatic moment. And they pick the right dramatic moments. They pick the right beats. And it's funny at times, too, to get you, especially the relationship between Tom Hanks and his kid, uh... I think that the characters, the old people could have been fleshed out a little bit better that actually helped Tom Hanks as his kid. I think that there should have been a little bit more, uh, a closer bond between those characters, the way they set them up. Jennifer Jason Lee is, is a little wasted, which is unfortunate. But all around, it's a great movie, and uh, and uh, Adam Weber gave me a great pick, and I'm, I'm happy, to, happy to have seen it, happy to have owned it, and uh, yeah, thank you. Great stuff. Peter, I can't come to your concert tonight. I'm working. Working at what? What's Papa's job? He works for Mr. Rooney. Who's got a hug for a lonely old man? Papa didn't have a father, so Mr. Rooney looked after him. You rule this town as God rules the earth. I love Mr. Rooney. 
We had nothing. He gave us a home, a life. He goes on missions for Mr. Rooney. Take Mike with you. No, Paul, Clint. Take Mike with you. They're very dangerous. That's why he brings his gun. Kinda, what the hell are you thinking? He saw everything. Can he keep a secret? He's my son. A man of honor always keeps his word. Michael, tomorrow when they find out we're gone, they're gonna come after us. I have to protect you now. I'd like to apologize, especially to you, Pa. You would like to apologize? Sons are put on this earth to trouble their fathers. Natural law. You gotta take him now. I know who to call. There's a guy who's done some work for us in the past. To be paid to do what you love. Isn't that the dream? Get out! I cannot fight you and them at the same time. I can take care of myself fine! You think it's my fault this happened? It was not your fault! You won't make it. Not with a little boy. What are you gonna do? Just one last thing, and then it's done. Look out for the tractor, Mike. Watch out for the tractor! We made it! Oh, yeah, yeah, we made it. This is the life we chose, the life we lead. And there is only one guarantee. None of us will see heaven. Michael could. Okay, we're gonna do the pick a movie. What do we got here? If you wanna enter the pick a movie, leave a comment on the Screaming Toilet uh, link in the description box, you'll see it. Also, uh, if you want to see written reviews of uh, Path of Blood and On Earth and Untold, The Path to Pet Cemetery, click there as well. Let's see who's got this. Christopher Dallier. Also, uh, last week was James Grimmer, and he picked Chino, or Chino, or Chino, Chino, the Charles Bronson movie. So that'd be cool, yeah. Uh, let me get into the Q&A. Move these bad boys. Okay. Tempo Tapas, a question for the Q&A. If you had to choose, would you prefer a movie to be a little too short or a little too long? I'd rather have a bit extra than not enough, but I'm guessing that I'm not. I'm in the minority. Uh, yeah, you are, I think, too, as well. I'd rather have it be too short. I'd rather want more than want less. Uh, when a movie makes me think and I'm like, man, I want to go back and watch more, uh, I don't like too much closure. As a kid, I wanted closure. As an adult, I don't need it. You never get closure in life. Why should you in movies? I mean, sometimes you want that in a movie, though, because you're in a fantasy world. Sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. I don't need it. I thought Baby Driver ended, like, 10 minutes too late myself. I think, I meant 10 minutes. It should have ended 10 minutes earlier, right when he gets out of the car. Movie should have been over. John Wilhelm, whatever happened to Puppets Creatures from Simon Little Bastards? Do you keep them in storage, or were they disposed after filming? If kept, you should probably let them out for a potential sequel. They need to breed, Dave. Uh, I actually have them. They're probably rotting. I almost got them out for you, but uh, I didn't want to dig them out. It was a lot more work than uh, I think in there to find them. But they're in boxes along with the uh, Halloween Spookies uh, little creatures as well. I'd prefer to do a Halloween Spooky sequel, but I don't know if that's possible. I mean, uh, for the familiars, a uh, sequel to the familiars. But uh, yeah, maybe we'll have a Slimy Little Bastards remake. I'm just kidding. Better puppets. Ben Miller, uh, have you ever had one of those moments with a movie of any genre which you didn't like it at first or weren't sure what to think about it, but it gets stuck in your head off and on again for months and then comes to the conclusion that it really was good? What comes, what movie comes to mind for you? I had this happen with Bring Me the Head of Alfredo Garcia. Rough but unforgettable film. I actually have one. I haven't seen it in years, but I remember seeing it at first and I was like, I hate that movie. I hate it. I was like 14. And then years and years pass, and I remembered how prolific that ending was to how profound i should say that ending was to me and it's don't look now by nicholas rogue uh that movie always that ending 
Just, I remember getting the chills. I remember feeling sick to my stomach. And I hated it because it was boring when I was 14, but that ending was so powerful, and I was like, that has to be a good movie. Any movie that can affect me like that has to be a good movie. So don't look now is your answer. Christopher Dallier, favorite low-budget kung fu film. Does Legend of the Seven Golden Vampires count? I'm counting that one, the Shaw Brothers one. Shaw Brothers is probably not very low-budget, though, is it? Hmm. Kung Fu. Low-budget Kung Fu. Ah, uh, boy. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Best of the Best 2 is not low-budget. I don't know if I know that many. Raw Force. There we go. That's low-budget. Favorite George Romero film. Day of the Dead is my favorite movie ever, so therefore, by default, Day of the Dead. George Romero is also my favorite director. Uh, Nick, how do you feel about the recent re-emergence of censorship? A lot of film and TV has gotten flack for being insinuating, demeaning, and has been pulled or edited. Is this a sin or just a damn shame? TV is a little bit different because it, it depends what channel it goes on, uh, and you're making it for someone uh, on a, a certain basis. So I don't know about that, but I, I am against censorship. If you don't like it, don't watch it. That's how I've always felt. Uh, you know, take Make sure your kids don't watch stuff you don't want them watching. That's how I feel. Not a big fan of censorship. Never have been. Has your co-host been in any films? Uh, if if not, do you think you can convince him to do so? He has been, actually. He was in Slimy Little Bastards. He was in uh, Halloween Spookies, which you can watch on YouTube for free. Uh, he's in both of those. He's in some of Dustin's movies. He's going to pop up in Benny and Steve as a creature in a suit. You won't recognize him, but he's in there. He uh, pops up in Basalt Zombies for a second as a concert victim. He pops up in, uh, geez, what else does he pop up in? Black Heart, White Hell. Uh, he's a victim in that one as well. Uh, so he pops up here and there in a bunch of, a couple of Dustin's movies and uh, all the ones I directed. Timothy Hayes. Dave, do you ever watch uh, music-related movies? Yeah, I, I like Shock Treatment quite a bit, I guess. That, is that uh, music-related? Uh, yeah, yeah, music-related. It's a musical. And uh, uh, Phantom of Paradise, that one's more music-related, is I think what you're thinking about. Really like that one. Pink Floyd, The Wall, like that one. I do I do watch them. I haven't seen them all, but uh, I, I like what I've seen for the most part. Not big on musicals, but I like the stuff like the rock operas. <laughs> Uh, do you ever review any TV shows or animated cartoon series released in DVD and or Blu-ray? You must have some TV shows you really like that got a DVD release. Uh, not really, but I love Tales from the Crypt. I would have loved to review the Tales from the Crypt episode to episode, but that would take a very long time. I just don't know if I have time anymore. The music played at the start of your YouTube videos. What is it called and what's it from? Uh, that is a Day of Anger by Riz Ortolani. You mean at the Screaming Toilet, uh, logo? That's Riz Ortolani, uh, and it's Day of Anger theme. Okay, guys, this is a little bit different, but let's hop into the DVD and Blu-ray update. The first one is the Hellraiser multi-feature set with Hellraiser 4, uh, Hellraiser 5, Inferno, Hellraiser 6, Hellseeker, and is this Hellraiser 8, Hellworld? I don't think Deader is available on Blu-ray. It's kind of hard to find, but uh, yeah. Uh, I have seen 4, 5, and 6. I've never seen 8. Uh, 4 I liked as a kid. That doesn't mean anything now. 5 I thought was okay. I don't know if I've ever finished it. And 6 I thought was okay as well. They're just basically the cop procedurals as Hellraiser movies. The next one we have here is... Is this the right way? Yeah, we have the Belco Experiment. I got this for $3.20 at Family Video. Yeah, I couldn't pass that up. Uh, not seen the Belco experiment. It's supposed to be kind of like mayhem, but uh, hopefully you guys can see all the features on there. But, yep. And then we got five from uh, Warner Archive. We got Freebie and the Bean, which I heard was very good stuff from the Pierce Cinema podcast. Looks pretty entertaining. Let me zoom out a little bit. There we go. Alan Arkin and James Kahn. Then we got The Wind and the Lion. This is interesting looking. This is by John Milius. Uh, yeah, it's got Sean Connery and Brian Keith. Uh, Brian Keith plays Teddy Roosevelt. It's revision. Uh, what is it? Uh, revisionist history or whatever. Kind of like Inglorious Bastards, the uh, Tarantino one. So yeah, that looks cool. Then what else do we got? Green Slime! I've heard this song a million times and never watched the damn thing. This is actually by the director of the uh, the uh, Battles Without Honor uh, and Humanity. He also did uh, Battle Royal. So this guy's had a very interesting career. Those look pretty cool. Uh, that one looks pretty cool, I mean. Uh, then we have Man in the Wilderness. I think this is the first one made. This is kind of like what uh, the Revenant 
uh, was based off this true story. This sounds like the same story. So I imagine is it Richard Harris, basically two guys leave him in the wilderness and he wants revenge. And the last from the Warner archives is the Yakuza with uh, Robert Mitchum. Who doesn't like Robert Mitchum? If you don't, you're wrong. Uh, here's a funny story. Uh, my grandma Parker, back in the day, my dad told me, uh, after she found out that Mitchum smoked a lot of marijuana, I don't think my grandma liked it. She used to call marijuana Mitchum. And she used to love Mar uh, Mitchum, but not after that, I guess. Uh, I've upgraded, or I switched. I bought the stuff on American uh, Arrow release because the other one was region locked. I don't know. I have a region free player. I'm a weirdo when it comes to that stuff, but I love this stuff. The taste that makes you hungry for more. Larry Cohen. It's also a great release. Then I also got uh, Django Prepare a Coffin, uh, the American version, which I think the other one's region free too, but I'm stupid because I want my numbers to match. That That's some real fucking retain it. that's just stupid on my part but that's the way i am i picked up casino which is a great martin scorsese movie not as good as uh, goodfellas but i always liked it and uh it's it's worth the price of a mission to watch uh, joe pesci punch uh <laughs> don rickles i love don rickles but it's just so funny uh fistful of dynamite ak duck you sucker by uh geez sergio leone this is a really great one rudd steiger james colburn uh i really like this movie and uh you guys will recognize uh freaking david warbeck and flashbacks uh good stuff and let me say this um scarface uh geez uh, the guy who played scarface al pacino stole his performance from rudd steiger in that movie uh, we have this double feature here of House on the Edge of the Park, which I adore, and Last House on Massacre Street. I actually think I have both of these from Code Red. I know I have House. I, I think I do have both of them. But uh, I kind of like what they're doing with these. They have a third one coming out. The other one released was uh, Chaos and Don't Look in the House Basement. Then we have these cool releases. Uh, I had the uh, old release of this one. Let me zoom out for you guys a little bit because this thing is big. But uh, this is the uh, Lord of Tears. I had seen this. This is a very atmospheric horror movie. And uh, on Kindness of Ravens, I haven't got to check out, but this looks really cool, this release. And I uh, got the third one that they did, the Black Gloves, which uh, looks pretty cool as well. It has the lady from Shrew's Nest in there, which she was tremendous in that role. So looks like the Owl Man's back. So... I'll have to check those out. And uh, last, the DVD of Jackson County Jail and Caged Heat. Like them prison things. Like these Corman releases as well. But uh, I really appreciate you guys uh, watching, of course. And uh, back to the video. Thank you guys very much for watching. And as always, you guys have a good one.